Now, breaking news from RTV6. I'm Mark Mullins, and thank you for joining us on RTV6 HASN and the RTV6 mobile app. We are breaking into our regularly scheduled programming for breaking news right now on RTV6 HTSN and the mobile app. Republican lawmakers think they have reached a deal on clarifying the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I'm going to go live to Republican House Speaker Brian Bosma and Senate President Pro Tem David Long to see how RFRA could change. As we uh, show you live pictures uh, from the State House, right now you see they're about to take the podium and explain how the changes will be coming to RFRA. As we uh, wait for the clarification to be announced by uh, Brian Bosma and David Long, uh, we can tell you that following this meeting, uh, there will be a committee meeting later so that uh, more lawmakers can go over these clarifications before Governor Pence is expected to sign this uh, new version of the RFRA. Governor Pence earlier this week giving a news conference saying that he would be open to hear changes that clarifies the R Religious Freedom Restoration Act to make it clear that businesses would not have the legal justification to deny services to anyone or to discriminate. The uh, governor had said that he'd be open to hearing a new proposal and clarifications on RFRA. Let's listen in. Time to be here today uh, to uh, discuss and observe as Senator Long and I fulfill the pledge that we made on Monday, and that is we would fix the RIFRA statute to assure that Indiana does not tolerate discrimination against any class of Hoosier. What was intended as a message of inclusion, inclusion of all religious beliefs, was interpreted as a message of exclusion, especially for the LGBT community. Nothing could have been truer from, or further from the truth, but it was clear that the perception had to be addressed. Hoosier hospitality had to be restored. The inclusion, the welcoming, attitude of every Hoosier had to be buttressed. We're pleased to tell you today that at 930 we'll be presenting what we believe is a very strong statement to assure that every Hoosier's rights are protected and won't be infringed upon by the enactment of RIFRA. Over the last week we have spent a great deal of time with many of the people that you see behind us. The corporate and civic leadership not just of Indianapolis but of the state of Indiana to assure that we could all land on the same page to let every Hoosier know that we value you. Gay, straight, black, white, religious, non-religious. We value each and every Hoosier. Senator Long. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Um, again, thank you all for being here today. Um, if there's one takeaway from all the calamity that's happened, I think in the, in the past week it would be this. That is that religious rights and individual rights can coexist in harmony together. I know I speak for many when I say that uh, in supporting the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act, or REFRA as we call it, uh, that it was never intended to discriminate against anyone. Its goal is simply to create a new standard that's really the common standard across the country in the federal courts and in 30 other states uh, in scrutinizing whether someone's religious rights have been infringed upon. Uh, but for many, the timing of the law created a different perception uh, yeah, that was about much more than that. And uh, that perception led to some of the national protests that we've seen over the past week or so. So in reaching the agreement to clarify the law, uh, which will unequivocally state, as the Speaker said, in the strongest possible terms that Indiana's RIFRA law does not and will not be able to discriminate against anyone, anywhere, at any time. Uh, we are hopefully putting an end to this misrepresentation of what this law was really intended to be. And it's really more than misperception, I think, is a better word to say. And most importantly, the, the change in the RIFRA law will hopefully put an end uh, um, to this greatest misperception of all, and that is that the people of Indiana discriminate because I can tell you honestly that nothing could be further from the truth. The Hoosier people are some of the most decent, thoughtful, kind, and welcoming people you'll ever meet. Hoosier hospitality is just a saying, it is a way of life here. And uh, I hope that uh, people come to understand that once again. The new legislative language upon which we have breached agreement, which the speaker spoke about, and which we'll be dealing with at 9.30 in a conference committee, was a result of a collaborative effort of many people. 
and there are some people to thank, and I want to recognize a few of them. First of all, the men and women who make up the Republican legislative bodies in both the Senate and the House, who uh, went through probably the most difficult political time of their careers and came through uh, strong for their state and, and doing the right thing here today, um, uh, stood up uh, as well as, uh, as you could have ever hoped. I'm very proud of them. I uh, also want to thank my colleague here, uh, Speaker Brian Bosma, who we've gone through many uh, uh, tough times in passing legislation in this state. Uh, well, this was our toughest challenge, I think, ever. And uh, I want to say that once again, he showed himself to be a strong leader and a, and a good man. Thank you, Brian. And there are two other people I want to recognize from the, uh, from the uh, community back here. Um, two people from the business community that really played a crucial role here, um, and the first is uh, Mr. Mark Miles, who's the CEO of the Holman Company and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And the second is Michael O'Connor, who is part of the executive team at Eli Lilly and Company. Both these gentlemen worked you know, night and day, quietly behind the scenes to help bring people together uh, and uh, a lot of the dialogue that took place to get the language uh, that we have right now. And gentlemen, I don't know where you're standing back there, but a heartfelt thank you to both of you. Uh, you did a great job for your state, and we appreciate you very much. I'm going to now introduce Mr. Jim Morris. And Jim is, uh, uh, for many of us in Indiana, doesn't need any recognition, but he is currently the uh, vice president for Pacers Sports and Entertainment, the Indiana Pacers Company. But he's been much more than that in a very historic career. Uh, he's best known nationally, I think, as the executive director of the United Nations uh, uh, Food Program, uh, the largest world uh, humanitarian program. Uh, uh, and uh, done a tremendous job, but most importantly, he really is known as Mr. Indianapolis. And I can't think of a more appropriate person to be speaking on behalf of the business community than Jim Moore. So thank you, Jim, for being here. Okay. Mr. Speaker and, and Senator Long, uh, thank you for your kind uh, introduction. I'm willing to meet with people afterwards to offer corrections. Um, a little levity. Uh, um, for 50 years, uh, Hoosiers, people who live in Indianapolis, have worked as hard as humanly possible in the most, with the most collegial, inclusive mindset to tell the world that we want them to come to Indiana, to Indianapolis, that they're welcome here, uh, that this is a dynamic, upbeat, happy, positive place. And the results of that effort have been extraordinary. Uh, USA Today this year said Indianapolis was the number one convention city in the United States of America. Last year, the New York Times said, when you're planning your travels for next year, there are 52 places in the world you ought to visit. And Indianapolis is one of those 52 places. Uh, literally 50 years ago, who would have ever thought that that kind of affirmation and recognition would have come to our city? Uh, our, our city, and, and this applies statewide, but you know, 100,000 people in Indianapolis, central Indiana, earn their livelihood in the hospitality entertainment business. We are a welcoming community. Hoosier hospitality is alive and well. We've had some tough days the last few weeks where we've been misunderstood uh, as to who we are and what we stand for. And I'm grateful that today uh, the Indiana General Assembly will absolutely make the bold, affirming statement that the um, Religious Act in no way can be used to dis discriminate and that this is the beginning of a much longer legislative policy that will absolutely put Indiana with the strongest possible commitment to non-discrimination across the board. The world is welcome here, 
and once they come, they will be well received and treated uh, as equals. Everybody is, is welcome in our city and our state for all the obvious reasons. I'm now going to begin to introduce my colleagues behind me. Uh, j just to amplify a bit of what I've said, I'd like to introduce to you Allison Melanchthon. Allison was the head of the Super Bowl committee. Uh, Allison was the longtime leader of the Indiana Sports Corporation. Uh, and really as responsible as anyone for building the reputation of our city and, and our state. Allison? Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. As Jim said, for generations, the city and state has established a national reputation for being welcoming, but not just welcoming, but for the genuine part of welcoming. We care about how people feel when they come here. And for generations, that has been genuine and that will continue. It is who we are as Hoosiers, and the outpouring of art from our city and state to everyone that came for Super Bowl and everyone who comes to this community over many years has been genuine and will continue to be. Today's a significant day. It's gonna show us in our true light, as Jim said, that people from all backgrounds and all beliefs come together with one common goal, and that is to show who we are as Hoosiers, genuine and welcoming. I'm really looking forward to working on this issue in the coming weeks uh, and appreciate all the support and everyone that's come together on this topic. Thank you. Just to put Allison's role and the role of the Indiana Sports Corporation, which is just a piece of who we are, but the, the economic impact of sports in our community, discounting all of the events, but just the day-to-day -day presence of uh, sports groups has a $4 billion impact on the central Indiana economy. That's significant. So I, I, I pay great tribute to our legislative leaders uh, who have worked through this and are, are going to address this in such a way that there will be no question about what Indiana stands for. If I could introduce now Michael Browning. Michael? Uh, Leonard, Michael Browning is Chairman of Browning Investments and Chairman of Visit Indy. Leonard Hoops is the President of Visit Indy. Dan Evans, a member of the U.S. Chamber Board of Directors, but is also the, the CEO of IU Health, one of the largest hospital health care systems in the world. Ryan Vaughn. Ryan is President of the Indiana Sports Corporation former president of the city council. Mark Miles is the CEO of Holman and & Company, and he's accompanied by Doug Bowles, who is president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And as you know, the, the Speedway is this remarkable, iconic institution that hosts two of the largest sporting events in the world. Uh, Bart Peterson is senior VP at Eli Lilly & Company for Corporate Affairs. Prior to that, he was a brilliant Democrat mayor of our city. He is accompanied by Mike O'Connor, uh, who uh, David talked about, and Carl Waiters, who is another member of the executive team at Eli Lilly and Company. Mark Levitt, Vice President of Cummins uh, Company, Chief Officer of the Cummins Foundation, and this brilliant, remarkable company from Columbus, Indiana, but also with a significant presence here. Scott McCorkle, who is the CEO of Salesforce. M.T. Ray, who is the Senior Vice President of Salesforce. 
Michael Huber, who is president of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, forgive me, Rob Hillman, president of Anthem Indiana and chairman of the Indy Chamber, Kevin Brenniger, who is chairman of the uh, president of the Indiana State Chamber of Commerce, Chris Douglas, who is uh, the founding president of the Rainbow uh, Chamber of Commerce and an Indy business person, Kathy Saras, who's co-founder of Indiana Equality. So these are my colleagues who have joined us to affirm our gratitude to the legislative leadership uh, for bringing this uh, issue to a head and putting a very strong statement on the books of who Hoosiers are. I now would like to introduce to you Bart Peterson from Eli Lilly and Company. As I mentioned, longtime uh, mayor of Indianapolis, extraordinary leader for our community. Um, Bart, and also a great business career, both before being mayor and after uh, now with a senior position with Lilly. Bart. Well, first of all, Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Speaker Bosma and Senator Long, for your personal involvement in seeking and encouraging a solution. Everybody up here, and the governor, and every member of our state legislature loves this state. But love is not enough. Public policy matters, and words matter. And so for the last four days or so, dozens of people have struggled together to find the right words to allow us to move past this crisis. People of goodwill with strongly held beliefs engaging in the incredibly hard work of self-governance. People from across the political and ideological spectrum who often find it difficult to agree because they view the world through very different lenses. But they found the words because the future of Indiana was at stake. And they value the future of our state above a desire to win, above the need for ideological purity, above the demands of politics. The healing needs to begin right now. For the first time ever, the words sexual orientation and gender identity appear in the Indiana statute, or they will, after this law is passed in the context of non-discrimination. But it will take time and it will take more work. I have complete confidence in our ability to heal and to rebound because today, I believe, we showed the world what the people of Indiana are really made of. Thank you all. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Scott McCorkle, who is the CEO of Salesforce uh, Marketing Cloud, and really important, Salesforce has recently acquired Exact Target, which is one of the great high-tech marketing companies to be built in our country, but it was built and developed by Hoosiers, and now uh, a part of, um, of Scott's company, Salesforce. Scott. Jim, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And first, thank you, employees of Salesforce. I'm so proud of what we have accomplished this week. Our involvement in Senate Bill 101 started as a grassroots effort led by you. Your concern and advocacy lit a fire with me, with our company, and it grew into a movement that's captured the attention of the world. Indianapolis is the second largest campus for Salesforce. We are the largest tech employer in the state of Indiana. We have thousands of amazing and innovative employees based in Indianapolis, and we want to build an environment where we can grow our business even more. Second, thank you to legislative leadership. I've lived in Indiana my entire life, from hunting and fishing in rural Indiana to building tech companies in Indianapolis. This state has given me so much. I love Indiana, and I know you do too. At the time of Indiana's greatest need, 
it was inspiring to see so many people come together and give back to the state that they love too. Today is a positive first step, but it is a first step in a larger discussion we acknowledge the importance of equal rights for all, and I'm excited about what will come in the next step of our journey. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to bring to the, the podium Chris Douglas. Chris, a local businessman, uh, founding president of Indianapolis's Rainbow Chamber of Commerce, and his colleague, Kathy Saris, who was co-founder of Indiana Equality. Thank you. To my fellow gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender friends in Indiana, nationally, and it seems around the world, I speak as a gay man, a founder of Indiana Equality, the Interfaith Coalition on Non-Discrimination, the Indianapolis Rainbow Chamber of Commerce, and is the author of the first comprehensive non-discrimination policy in Indiana in the year 2000, covering sexual orientation and gender identity. Mine was the first mainstream business to advertise in the city's gay newspapers and to sponsor the city's pride event. To my fellow Hoosiers, I speak as an eighth generation Hoosier from a family of abolitionists, farmers, businessmen, professionals, teachers, and veterans. And to my fellow Republicans, I speak as a lifelong Republican, a decorated Air Force officer, a capitalist, a business owner, and an employer. Twenty years ago, next year, in 1996, I accepted interviews from the Indianapolis Star and from the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette while I was in the process of founding an Indiana chapter of a gay political organization, the Log Cabin Republicans, calling for a policy of non-discrimination against gay citizens in Indiana. Shortly after, I learned to my sorrow but not to my surprise that I had lost my corporate job, a job for which I was well prepared, which I was performing well, and that I loved. The measure announced today, for the first time in Indiana, law establishes sexual orientation and gender identity in the context of recognizing and protecting our rights as equal citizens of the state of Indiana. We know that this is only the beginning the end is that the equality guaranteed to all other Hoosiers through the Indiana Civil Rights Code is guaranteed also to us. Indiana is a democracy, and so we know that must follow a democratic process. We are confident in the shared intent and commitment of the people around us and of the people of goodwill across Indiana to discuss introduce, debate, and ultimately pass these necessary protections. That effort, which is necessary in 29 other states and federally, begins today here in Indiana. Much hard work has been done by many people over many years to achieve progress in Indiana. We would not be here today were it not, in my opinion, for people like Kathy Saris, Mitch Daniels, Bill Osterley, Zach Adamson, Mary Byrne, Mark St. John, Jerry Tor, and many, many other people. Indiana is a great state with loving people. In the last week, we have seen Hoosiers rise. Republicans and Democrats, small businesses and corporations, people and institutions of faith, our colleges and universities, Hoosiers of every variety, good and tolerant. This is the Indiana we know. We know that Hoosiers will show all who come here the warmth and hospitality for which Indiana has been known for 200 years. Thank you.
Before we uh, turn over to questions, I just want to share one last thought, uh, and then Senator Long and I will help direct questions. Uh, a lot of humbling moments over the last week, and I had one of those was when I had a chance to sit down with uh, Greg Luganis and spend about an hour uh, just visiting. And, uh, you know, personal sports hero to me, watched him dive many times, <clears throat> and he shared with me the personal hurt that he felt when he heard the incorrect message that Indiana supported discrimination against uh, the LGBT community. I extended an apology to him, not for actions taken, but for messages received. And uh, we extend, I personally extend that policy, to, or that apology to anyone that received that same message. We're here, we're here to make it right, we're here to assure uh, those who feel that the RIFRA statute will discriminate against them, that it will not be used for that purpose. With that, and to, just to, because time is short, just let me say I agree with the speaker completely in what he just said. Well, did, was that on tape anywhere? Yes, sir. <laughs> Hopefully not. We'll be happy to take your questions. Well, honestly, the, the language wasn't needed to clarify the statute legally. It is need to, needed to clarify it, the perception of it, and we fixed it. It'll be in there now. I think you can say, I think you can say honestly, no one who supported that bill that I know of felt that they were creating a discriminatory situation. It was about putting the nationally recognized standard for review of religious liberty into the Indiana Code and that because our courts hadn't recognized themselves, that was the purpose. Putting what in? This, we're, we're, we're here to announce that it's fixed, and so we're looking to the future. I'm glad we're had, we've had the discussion. It's been healthy for everyone, and I think uh, we're a better state for it, uh, better legislators for it as well. So in that sense, I'm, uh, in some ways, I'm glad we've had to go through this process. I think it's been a good and healthy thing. You know, I was asked that on CNN the other day, and I wish Senator Long and I were in charge of public relations, public, public relations for the state. That's up to all of you all. Uh, the message is clear today. It's coming from Republicans, Democrats, corporate leaders, uh, the uh, uh, community leaders of all stripes that Indiana is open for business. We welcome everyone. We discriminate against no one. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, uh, already it is uh, very long as you described that, that small but vocal cry is already at it again, you know, saying that this is the Eric Millers, the Mike Clarks of the world are just going, you know what, crazy. Uh, and emails from Hold On Yards, do you worry that they have enough influence to derail what you folks have worked so hard for to get to to this day? No. I mean, everyone has the right to free speech. It's one of the reasons we're here today as well. Uh, I'll just say that for the vast majority of Hoosiers, they don't represent them and they don't represent me. I disagree with their interpretation of this. Uh, and uh, I think, as I said before, you know, religious uh, liberty and individual liberty can coexist together, and we're proving that today. This next step that we would have referred to, uh, has anything been put in place in the uh, review committee? Well, it's a big policy step, Jim, as we've said several times. There are obviously strong feelings. I'll just tell you, strong feelings in both directions on this. And uh, this is the beginning of the discussion. If there's one positive outcome of this, I think, is that the discussion is taking place, and uh, that will be for future sessions of the General Assembly to determine. Will Bianco? I think it was sending the exact wrong message. You know, I think that it's been a misperception about the law, and I think we're clarifying what it doesn't do today. But there's also a place for that law, and, and, and used appropriately and properly, which is to put a, the, the national standard, as you will, the, the, the majority standard in Indiana law uh, for when someone's religious liberties, of whichever faith they have, whichever, uh, if that is a, perceived as an attack by a government action, uh, they have the right to use this to defend themselves. And this is what the court will use as their level of scrutiny on that, that particular action. That's appropriate. 
unfortunately the, the misperception is the reason that we've had to be here today and to take care of that problem. I hope we've accomplished that. We've made every effort to do so. And I think the people standing behind us today believe that we have, I think, is a very strong show of support for, for our efforts. So I'm very grateful, by the way, again, for all of you being here. It sends a great message. Brandon? Uh, RIFRA says, or, or the, the language says, RIFRA can't be used to authorize discrimination on any given case. Right. But the fact that sexual orientation and gender identity are in the state civil rights statute means it should still be legal to do so, right? It means they have the rights of every other uh, Hoosier that's not in a protected class. So. Article 1, Section 3 protects uh, religious liberty. The rest of the Constitution protects individual liberty. So we just made it abundantly clear that RIFRA does not apply in the circumstances of concern. I think I can add, too, this is a level of discussion and scrutiny on this issue that hasn't occurred before in Indiana, as it hasn't happened in 29 other states. And the federal government also doesn't have a protected class status. We're talking about it now. And I think that's a good thing, a healthy thing, and uh, will lead to a, a very robust discussion, I'm sure, next year. Uh, I don't think that's a negative, I think it's a positive. Scott, come on up. Um, everyone we got behind the judgment, how well will this deal bring national business back in? What are going to bring the sales force to you? Well, I, I can say Salesforce is very excited about Indiana and Indianapolis. We believe in equality for all. We felt this law and the situation didn't support that, and we spoke out, and we're, we're very pleased with this first step. As the, as the senator says, it's a journey. It's a very important first step, but it starts a dialogue that we're very excited about, and this is a great place to start and grow a business. You know, we, we're just very excited about this step. And we're very excited about Indiana and our employees. And it's a great company. We're growing fast, and, and we're very excited. Eric, I just, I'll just add, we have representatives of national LGBT groups. I'm not going to point them out, but we've met with a number of them. And we've been informed that they, have a, they believe that this legislation removes the concerns that have been expressed. Of course, they'd like to see further steps. But I think the national concerns that were raised that we're all hearing about are put to bed. We can unequivocally say that RIFRA cannot be used to discriminate against anyone. Uh, the conference committee report that you'll see uh, will clearly address that. Now, what people think they can and can't do uh, in the general public, that, that's for the courts to decide. But RIFRA will not be used for that purpose. Do you feel like you're letting down anybody in the religious community in the end? No, not at all. No. This is a, we've said before, uh, Brian has, but we're, we are, you, these things can coexist together. Religious liberty is a First Amendment right and something that's uh, as precious as free speech and the right to assembly and the freedom of the press. Uh, and it's important that it be protected. Uh, and uh, but as our individual rights as well, they can coexist. They do coexist, and that's that's for everyone: religious liberty for all, and freedom for all. And I think uh, that's why we're standing here today to espouse those beliefs, which are as American as apple pie. Yeah. Uh, Speaker, uh, Senator Hall, there was a little mention of the governor's role in these talks and back and forth. Uh, does that mean that you're going to the ball on this, and if he vetoes it, you will override it? No, I actually, I failed. I was intended to mention the governor's name. I tried to whisper it to David when he was speaking. I, and we were I, so intent to let others speak. The I governor's been, as usual. The governor yeah, has been actively involved in these discussions as well. He hasn't indicated uh, his course of action on this, but uh, we've been very inclusive of discussions with him. And he's been uh, very positive in his, uh, his responses to uh, bringing this to a close. He's aware of all that's going on. He has the right to have, as all governors do, uh, to read the bill in its final form coming from our conference committee today. And uh, the guy will speak for himself, but I feel very positive about all this. Senator? Yes.
Yeah, Kevin, I, I've already said it. Uh, it. It was misinterpreted, but all we can say is we are sorry that that misinterpretation hurt so many people. Uh, that wasn't, and neither of us were the author or sponsors of this bill. We did vote for it. We supported it. Uh, we didn't believe it discriminated against anyone. Since it's been depicted that way, it needs to be fixed. That's what we pledged publicly to do. That's what the folks behind us assisted us in doing. It's fixed. Is the damage uh, able to be turned back? That's yet to be seen. I think it will be. The healing process starts today. This is a very important statement we're making, and I hope it's heard loud and clear across the country. Okay. This is for both of you. Given your discussion with the national LGBT groups in Indiana, um, personally, has it changed your decision to potentially have LGBT as a protected class? I, I think it's, it's uh, opened uh, perspectives, and it's, it's a big policy step that needs to be discussed, and uh, we'll move forward. You know, it's, it's not been said, many of us have many friends, family members uh, that are in the uh, LGBT community. So. We don't want discrimination against anyone. It's never the intent, and I'm sure the discussions will continue in the future. Because that is where the discussion is gone. Well, really, the national backlash was because people presumed that RIFRA allowed it authorized discrimination, especially against uh, the LGBT community. It did not, but we have made it abundantly clear in the legislation that we've worked on together with everyone here and our members uh, to resolve that once and for all. I, if I might just say one thing before uh, we answer more questions. There are two individuals here who we failed to introduce uh, and it's inadvertent and we just want to make sure that it's done. Tony Mason, who's the president of the Indianapolis Urban League, is with us today, as well as Rafael Sanchez from the Hispanic community in Indianapolis. We appreciate their presence here. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. And I apologize for, uh, for that being left out of the introduction of the leaders in the community that are here behind us. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The gay community in Indiana is not going away. The LGBT community is not going away. We're not going to let any of these people off the hot seat. We've struck a compromise. They're going to be hearing from us again. I've met numerous times with Brian on a lot of other issues. We're not going away. And that's why Chris and I are here. We're not going away. This ultimately is going to happen in Indiana. Hey, okay, amen. Mr. Speaker, Senator Long, basic nuts and bolts question. What was there to pass this today? Yes. <laughs> one, one more question so we can start talking. For those of you who are here from out of town, rarely is it that unanimous on something. <laughs> A question? Last question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, just to be real clear, why not add LGBT protections to the state's civil rights law? It would send uh, even a stronger message than the one you're sending today. Um, why not do that if we all believe in equality? You know, that's, that's a huge policy a statement or a huge policy change here, uh, Tony, as we've said two or three times. 29 states don't uh, have that. A category of a protected class, nor does the federal government. To, so to expect lawmakers uh, to have a major policy change on a dime and on the fly isn't realistic. So what has happened here is that discussion has begun. Whether, whether Hoosiers want to have it or not, uh, we, there have been real discussions about this, and there are plenty of people, including Chris Douglas standing right behind me, who are very interested in uh, seeing that happen. I think Chris, I think Chris is going to want to say something to this as well, and we're going to let him uh, speak his mind as well, because Kathy clearly did. And he wants to, they came together, and I just, I do want to say um, that it's apples and oranges in this sense. The RIFRA Act was never intended and does not, in my opinion, discriminate, but the perception that it did cause us to be here uh, to make sure that it was clear, loud and clear. The discussion about uh, special class protection for the LGBT community uh, is going to happen, all right? That's, that today has started that discussion. Uh, it is a big policy question, and it's important that we hear from all Hoosiers on it. Uh, we, we're deliberate uh, in the way we approach things in Indiana, uh, but it will happen. And uh, I think it's important for people to know that. I know Chris wants to say something as well, so I'm going to let him do that right now. 
I have every confidence that the majority of Hoosiers are opposed to discrimination on these bases. I have every confidence that when we go through the proper legislative process, the necessary protections will be added to the Civil Rights Code. The value of that process is that we're talking with Hoosiers across the state and obtaining their explicit support rather than a uh, abrupt movement uh, which may not even, which I, I don't even think is legislatively possible. This session is almost done. You can't just introduce a new bill. We know what kind of support exists across the state. And I think uh, it will be a very healthy process having this discussion in Indiana. And I am fully confident of what the product will be. So will either of you leaders guarantee a hearing next session on that? I'm Tony, we're, we're obviously focused on today and having a very successful conclusion uh, over the next four weeks to the first session of the 119th General Assembly. Uh, what happens after that will be uh, the next uh, challenge. But I think it's probably likely, Tony, I think given the level of discussion, but I don't think it's fair to say what will or won't happen next year. But you can see that this discussion has been elevated in Indiana, and it's an important one. So I look forward to uh, finishing this session, heading toward next year as well. I want to thank all of you uh, for being here, but most importantly, thank these people, these great Hoosiers behind us, who came together from all walks of life to say that we stand together and united in uh, the loud statement that we support religious freedom and we also support individual rights for everyone across the board. Thank you all for being here. Brian, thank you very much. You've been watching RTV6 live coverage. Republican leadership in the legislature saying the RFRA law cannot and will not discriminate against anyone at any time. They were hoping to clear up any question that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act would protect businesses discriminating against gays and lesbians based on religious beliefs. Well, House Speaker Brian Bosma and Senate President David Long say they want to stress that religious freedom rights and individual rights can coexist. We are continuing our coverage on HTSN, the RTV6 app, with much more on the new measures that lawmakers are taking to clarify RFRA. Then we will have reaction and continuing coverage on the news at noon here on RTV6 and our website, theindiechannel.com. I'm Mark Mullins. This has been RTV6 Breaking News. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming.